Welcome. Well, my name is Steve Duncan, and today I'm here to share some of our experiences with the use of prescribed fire in western juniper woodlands. This shows the distribution of western juniper. As you can see, it is primarily a, a western states species, occurring in, primarily in Oregon, California, Nevada, and southwestern Idaho. It uh, occurs as uh, two subspecies. Subspecies Occidentalis is primarily in the north. Subspecies Archstralis is primarily found along the mountains in California and Nevada. Recently, the two subspecies have been redescribed as separate species, but it is currently listed at the NLCS plant database. These show the figures show the range maps of the Juniperus Occidentalis, which was the old Occidentalis Occidentalis and of Juniperus grandis, which is the old Occidentalis australis. Keep in mind with these uh, NRCS plant database maps is that a single occurrence in a county uh, shades in that whole county, so the distribution is much more continuous than what they actually are. This is a magnificent uh, western juniper found in uh, California, and it illustrates uh, some of the characteristics of some very old trees although most trees are not the size of this one. But it does show that the older trees typically attain this kind of flat top nature. As they get older, the apical growth uh, slows down relative to the lateral growth, and so they take on this appearance of much more flat top or more circular in their crown rather than the more typical conical shape, going conical shape. This one is, by Ica McCorn, has been estimated to be around 3,000 years old, which is incredible. Uh, we get some old ones in Idaho, but nothing, nothing like this. These two photographs show the increase in distribution of peak western juniper in eastern Oregon over a 100-year time period. The upper photograph taken in the 90 shows scattered juniper on the, on the ridge in the background. A recent photograph taken in 19 and shows that this woodland has become more or less continuous across ridge. This is a very typical response of many places of western juniper. And at the broad scale, this is some of our work in Idaho. Uh, you can see the increase in juniper at this watershed. And we took 1989 imagery and classified the watershed vegetation type, and then used some analysis to roll back the successional clock. 1900 and 1800, showing the, the increase in, in western juniper, which in this area actually began to, to happen around 1850. And in our watershed, we have found an uh, eight to ten fold increase in juniper dominated area within the, within the watershed over this time period. As this change occurs, this is often what happens to the understory. The understory plants are, started, are affected by the presence of the juniper, affects the availability of resources, and so many of them die and are replaced to some extent by other species. So we have to end up with this understory that is very depauper in terms of the number of plants present, and those skeletons in the foreground that are mostly sagebrush that have died as a result of the uh, light competition for the western juniper woodland that has developed around it. And this figure shows the, the changes then of the fuel loading by, by different size classes. And you can see the, the green, which are the fine fuels, primarily grasses, really declines as the juniper develops. That to some degree it is replaced by juniper litter. Uh, which is of the same size class, but it has much different characteristics. In fact, does not burn nearly as, as readily as the, the, the grass fuel do. We also get a decline in the tenor fuels, which is mostly yes, in this area is the sagebrush that is that is dying and decomposing and resulting in that decrease in the fuel loading. Here we have the then the succession kind of illustrated in these six photographs, starting with a post-fire grassland, upper west, and a old multi-story juniper woodland 
lower right. And we'll talk more about this phase one, two, three classification later. The following the disturbance, the sagebrush reestablishes back on the site, uh, as in the upper center photograph, and juniper begins to develop on the site. They grow up, become more and more dominant, and eventually you have an old multi-story juniper wood. This is a very slow process, however, and probably takes 300 to 500 years or more to manifest itself on the landscape. These two are the earlier stages of succession, the grassland and the sage fresh step stages. They usually only contain uh, very, very small juniper or juniper seedlings, and consequently, juniper control is generally not necessary, nor is it recommended at this stage in stages of woodland development. Here we have a phase one woodland where the trees have begun to get above the canopy of the sagebrush and become more obvious on the site. And our, but at this stage, they, really, they haven't begun to really influence at the site level at least the abundance of, of the sagebrush step plant on the site. It's important to note, however, that at this stage, trees are often become uh, reproductively mature, which happens when they're, at least in our area, around 30 to 50 years of age. When they start to produce seeds on site, they then still often store some of these seeds in the soil. And this then consequently really reduces the longevity of treatments of, of any kind because you have on site of availability of unit per crop of year. If they are not present, they need to be then transported up into the site, usually by an animal vector. This is the stage also that juniper plants start to become tall enough to provide perches for raptors and other kinds of sage grouse predators. At one time, I thought really the effects on sage grouse didn't occur until juniper started to have a dramatic effect on the other story, because this was their, their forage base and their, and their primary habitat. But it, uh, recent research has shown that it actually happens at a much earlier stage that even when the canopy cover is very low, in this case 4%, they found almost no use of uh, the sagebrush areas by sage grouse because they're avoiding these areas that better avoid predators. Phase two is illustrated here. This is kind of the early part of, of phase two, but the juniper are starting to uh, become larger, become more dominant on the site. We kind of have a stage here where sagebrush step of the juniper woodland uh, co-dominant of uh, the production of bi uh, biomass in the decline, but still generally we have enough that we can use prescribed burning on these sites uh, fairly easily. But this is the stage now where things really start to happen when it comes to the composition as this woodland continues to grow and develop. And eventually we end up with this phase three, which are very dense spans of relatively young juniper. And that, as we saw earlier in this upper left photograph, we can see that the fine fuels are influenced by the presence of the juniper. And consequently, these become pretty difficult to burn under, under the more moderate conditions. One can uh, get them to burn. This photograph on the upper right is a prescribed burn. And uh, it's actually two years following the prescribed burn, you can see that even two years after, there's still lots of bare ground. So what we have happen at this phase three is that the phase, the development of the woodland really starts to diminish the understory plants, and then the very high intensity, severity fires needed to kill those juniper often create high mortality of, uh, of the plants that remain. This is that same area seven years later, and you can see that even after this time, time period, there's still lots of bare ground, and it's, it's quite an open site. The final stage are these old multi-story junipers that contain these very, very large uh, junipers. Uh, and as I said, uh, many of these, we found many trees, are 1,000 years old, certainly very commonly find them more than 500 years old. And the fuel conditions don't allow them to burn under just about anything but very, very dense fires. On the right this is uh, a wildfire that occurred and um, creating a very, very uh, open site, lots of bare ground, a very uh, warm site in terms of 
solar radiation. So it is, it's uh, quite a severe site for lots of plants to become established into. Well, why do people use prescribed burning in Western Juniper? And the, one of the foremost among them is storage production, both wild for wild and domestic animals. Water management and conservation is another um, uh, objective often. And certainly the presence of juniper influences the capture, the storage, and the release of water both in the landscape. Our area, we a lot of the year's precipitation as winter snow or light spring rains and interception of this moisture by the canopy of the juniper can result in it often evaporating back into the environment or into the atmosphere and never ever enter into the soil at all. Fuel management is, is another objective. And certainly as you well know, the fire can change the amount, the size class distribution, and the vertical distribution of fuel on a site. Landscape diversity is another very important one, and for me, one of the most important ones because it has a lot of influences on a lot of the other objectives and values of these areas. And by landscape diversity, I mean it's the change in the proportion of vegetation types within a landscape. If we refer back to those earlier maps, you can see that from 1989 map, uh, we have a much greater abundance of juniper in the dark green and a much lesser abundance of particularly the sagebrush steppe types, resulting then in, a, over time, a simplification of the diversity of these landscapes. And Diversity is important because we can see in here we be able to have species that are associated with all the different stages. And in the shrub step, we have a number of species that are present. This is illustrating birds. Earlier stages, when it's primarily a grassland, we have other birds that are occurring in those areas. Don't occur when, as the sagebrush and certainly as the juniper become established. And later, as the woodland develops, we have another suite of birds that, that occupy the sites. And so some are better at, at occurring across uh, several different kinds of stages, and others are very specifically associated with particular types. This is illustrates with, with uh, birds, but you can find the very same thing if one looks at small mammals or butterflies or beetles or soil uh, microflora, for that matter. We have a lot of concern for a number of sagebrush that public and species is often characterized by the, by the bird group. But it did, again, as I said earlier, we can also use butterflies or vascular plants or other things to illustrate this. What are some other considerations then as we start to start thinking about our, our use of prescribed burning? And the chief among them is the soil type and the ecological site, I think. One can really use these as predictors of what may happen on this site needed or after a wildfire occurs for that matter. But in that, we often like to have a good abundance of the deep-rooted perennial grasses. They have recommended that we have at least two plants per, per meter square, which, which is about two plants per 10 square feet. These are important then. They create safe sites for other plants. They reduce the likelihood of erosion, putting in catching snow, they just create a lot of other kinds of changes in the presence in the site post burn that is important. The presence of annual grasses is the opposite. And so if one has annual grasses, I've listed the uh, cheap grass that we say and not a here. Uh, but uh, certainly there are uh, lots of other annual grasses that one can add to this list changes of, of the species. These annual grasses are important because if they become dominant on the site, they can really change fuel characteristics of those sites, the probability of having another burn happen. Certainly we have lots of other weeds uh, introduced and maybe we need to be concerned about and again the presence of these on or near the sites can be a consideration in terms of whether or not one wants to treat that site. I've already mentioned the sage grouse and other sage brush step obligates. So this is often is a consideration. Much of the of the area of the sage grouse in particular has become a very, very important consideration. 
There are other sensitive species. There are those that are protected by corresponding standard species act, but there are other sensitive species that that one may have uh, locally that one can consider as well when they're planning. And livestock grazing is, is always an important issue. Uh, almost always we find that we need to rest the area of the year that uh, you're going to burn just to maintain as much of the fine fuel on the site as possible. There's, to some degree, it's a fine fuel limited system already, and so removal by livestock makes it increasingly difficult to to have the uh, fire spread very readily across these sites. It may also require livestock that rest or deferment for one or more years following to allow plants to, to recover from the fire to produce seed on site that become established following the treatment. We also have archaeological uh, resources to consider. A fire does affect archaeological resources, and so we need to be uh, aware and appreciate the uh, for this consideration, and I think in California, the Office of Historical Preservation, ones that have an archaeologist that could help one with his advice on a particular area. Smoke is becoming an ever increasing consideration. Uh, many, many people are affected by smoke, um, and, uh, and so smoke dispersal is a very important uh, uh, consideration. Fortunately, in a lot of the western juniper areas, well, the, the population density of humans is fairly low, and so that makes it a little bit easier, but we still need to, to keep it in mind uh, where the smoke, how much smoke is going to be produced over a what time period, and where it is likely to go. Another consideration is that juniper better uh, enough. I've already talked a little bit about that, but the, the older stands produce a very thick mat of five, six, even up to eight inches thick of juniper litter and dust. When these burn, they produce a very, very severe fire. And it burns for a long time, and we get these patches underneath these middle-aged and older trees where we have a dust layer that there is often very little growing under these trees to begin with, and then this very, very severe fire often kills most of what was there originally. We also have to think about what are the consequences of not doing juniper control. One of those is, as I mentioned, the loss of sagebrush step habitat and all these associated species. And often then people use birds, but we could use vascular plants or others to illustrate this as well. Yet another issue is that as the woodland becomes more and more developed, it requires a higher fire intensity consequently fire severity to control those units. And then finally, because of the, the higher fire intensity, fire severity, and loss of the species, we have a decrease in the post-fire resilience of these treated areas. But fire remains a viable alternative to the treatment and control of, of western juniper in, in many, many areas. Well, what are some of the things that we've learned over the years of doing uh, burning within Western Juniper? Prescriptions are things that often people ask about, and it's really difficult to characterize very easily what the right prescription is because the fuel can vary so much. The context of the area you're burning varies. There are many factors that, uh, that really influence what the right prescription for a situation is. Generally, we find we need to have fairly dry conditions, low relative humidity, and relatively uh, uh, good wind speeds. And somewhere around 10 to 15 miles an hour are the wind speeds that I prefer to use. If you get very low wind speeds, it starts to become less, uh, it becomes more erratic in terms of the direction, and it's also less effective at helping you, helping fire spread across the across the area that you want to treat. In terms of timing, I prefer to look at burning in late summer. As we get into the fall, we start having the showers starting coming in. It becomes more and more difficult to get those get those prolonged dry conditions that we need uh, of a week or so to let the vegetation dry out to the point where you can get a very effective burn. 
whether or not we should wait for rain, that's, a, that's a, another question. Uh, initially, when we started, we, we waited for the rains to begin. I've decided that that's probably not as, as important as I used to. Uh, one of the things that happens is the rain starts to come very late in the summer or in the fall. We start to have cooler conditions. Again, it becomes more difficult to get into prescription. The other thing that can happen when we start getting rains is you start having green up of some of the herbaceous plants. And so this green up then not only creates a more a higher moisture content fuel, but it, I think it also makes those green up plants more susceptible to being burned. So when the plant is in a true summer dormancy, it's probably the most resilient in terms of being able to recover. Ignition type, there are many ways one can go about uh, igniting the unit. Uh, and this depends a lot on the size of the unit, the context of the unit, the, the, the road access within and around the around the area that you're, you're trying to burn. Ignition pattern. I am convinced that just keeping it simple is the best is the best approach. And these last two really are some of the main considerations are safety. And when you start having complicated ignition patterns, people start getting mixed up. And yes, they do forget which is their left hand and their right hand. And we've had people light on the wrong side of the fire line. You know, when we start having these very, very complicated patterns, the increasing likelihood of having those kinds of things happen, having others being caught uh, out in the fire. Some other treatment options include individual tree felling and mastication. Well, we won't cover those here. Uh, and there are many uh, publications and lots of information available if you're interested in these. I would say that uh, these are often uh, uh, chosen when you start getting into the later stages of woodland uh, development because you're no longer dependent on having the fuels necessary. Some additional sources of information are listed here. The two on the left, publications by uh, Rick Miller, Oregon State. One is on the general ecology is an Oregon State University uh, bulletin. And the other one asking the right questions is is produced by Sage stuff. And it covers a lot of the kinds of things that we talked about webinar. Two others produced by Sage Step are the Sage Step are these fuel guides. They allow using fire behavior uh, models and those kinds of things often run these estimates of fuel loads and these can be helpful in providing that information. The um, great the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and the Joint Fire Science Program have uh, also produced a number of uh, fact sheets and other kinds of uh, information on the burning of, of western juniper or other vegetation types. Thank you. I've listed here my contact information. I would suggest probably that the email is the, is the best approach if you're trying to get a hold of me if you have some additional questions. Hopefully you'll find this helpful as you start to plan or think about using prescribed burning western juniper with them.